A very warm welcome to everyone. Thank you for coming to our uh, lecture series, The Multilingual Minds. My name is Theo Marinis. Uh, I'm Professor of Multilingualism at the University of Constance, and I'm coordinating the MA in Multilingualism and the project The Multilingual Minds. I'm part of the Department of Linguistics, and this is how this lecture series was created. The lecture series is co-organized by the Department of Linguistics, the Center of Multilingualism at the University of Constance, and the project The Multilingual Minds. So this is a series that is going to take place from today until the middle of February. And in that series, we have invited people that are doing research on multilingualism across many different perspectives, looking at multilingualism from linguistics, from education, from speech and language pathology, um, and from neuroscience, so that we can provide an, um, a mixture of multilingual research from different perspectives. For this lecture, uh, I decided to present to you a study that is looking at bilingual children who acquire complex syntax in the heritage versus the majority language. And we will present some results to you from a group of Turkish English bilingual children who live in the UK. So I'm going to start and give you a little bit of an overview about multilingualism in the UK. I'm pretty sure that many of you know the context, but this is a reminder that uh, the UK has a large number of multilinguals and a large number of multilingual children who are attending school. Those children also speak many different languages. So based on the, on the uh, census on the, of the National Association of Language Development and Curriculum, um, in um, uh, children between the age of five and, and 18, um, um, there were 360 different languages spoken between them. And according to the census in 2013, there were more than 600,000 children who spoke English as an additional language. The data and the study we're gonna to present to you today come from a project that started many years ago, and that it looked at how children who are bilingual, how they process language in real time, and we were looking at a comparison between bilingual children and bilingual adults, comparing them to monolingual children and adults. And we also had groups of children with specific language impairment or develop developmental language disorder, as it's called nowadays. And in that project, we were looking at language acquisition and processing, comparing the first with the second language. We were comparing children with adults, and we also wanted to find out what the profile is of children who have developmental language disorders. The aims of that project was to look at how children process language in real time, and we were looking at many different phenomena. We looked at actives and passives, pronouns, reflexives, and subject verb agreements. And we also wanted to find out how bilingual children perform in standardized assessments, looking at grammatical development, vocabulary, but also memory, phonological memory, and working memory. Now this project finished many years ago, and we have published studies on many different phenomena. And here you can see a list of the phenomena and some of the publications. So we, we published results on tense and agreement marking, passives, binding, gender marking, and the acquisition of articles. Now, um, the studies that I'm listing here were looking at English. So these children had English as an additional language, so they were bilingual, with Turkish as a one and English as a two. So the majority of those studies were looking at English as an L2. But apart from those publications, um, we also had um, some publications on Turkish, and these were um, uh, publications that related to the PhD of Duygu Özge, who was working at the time as a, at the beginning as a research assistant, and then she was part of the team as a PhD student. And you can also see here the list of the other members of the research team. And so most of the publications have been on English, but uh, Duygu was working on Turkish. And this is why we have also some work on Turkish. Now, we're living in a, in a very str strange situation where it's very difficult to collect new data. So this was the time where 
we're going back and we're looking, you know, what, what other data have we got, have we collected and we haven't published yet. And this study that we're going to present to you today comes from data that have been collected several years ago, but we haven't published them yet. And the data are on relative clauses in Turkish. So because they are on relative clauses in Turkish, I'm going to present some information about what relative clauses in Turkish look like so that everyone is in the picture and can understand what kind of sentences we're going to be looking at. So rel relative clauses in Turkish are very different from relative clauses in English. So here we have an example of a relative clause. So the English translation would be the lion that pushes the gorilla. But we can see here that the relative clause is pre-nominal. So the lion is the noun that is modified by the relative clause and the relative clause precedes the noun. So relative clause in Turkish are pre-nominal. They precede the noun they modify. And they involve movement as in, in English, but in Turkish, the gap precedes the antecedents. So we can see here uh, another two relative clauses, the lion that pushes the gorilla, so gorilla eats an aslan, and we can see that the gap is before uh, the filler. And then we have another relative clause, the lion that the gorilla pushes, so we have an object relative clause, so gorilla intigi aslan, and we can see again that the gap is before the antecedent. So this makes relative clauses in Turkish very different from English. And this is one of the reasons why it's interesting to see how Turkish English bilingual children, how do they acquire English relative clauses and Turkish relative clauses? Is there a difference between the two? Are there any effects of course linguistic effects from the L1 to the L2 or the other way around? Now, another aspect which is important for relative clauses in Turkish is that relativization is carried out by morphosyntax. So here we have again the subject relative clause, correlate and aslan, and we can see that uh, there is a morpheme here, the unmorpheme, which is a relativizer for subject relative clauses. And in an object relative clause, here the, the line that the gorilla pushes, so gorillin, we have the duck morpheme, which is used for object relative clauses. And together with this morpheme, we have also a possessive morpheme and agreements also with a genitive agreements with the subject. So as you can see, we have morphology that gives you cues about uh, the relative clauses, whether something is a subject relative clause or something is an object relative clause. And for object relative clauses, we also have the, the additional morphology uh, where we have agreement with the subject. So there have been a lot of studies looking at the acquisition of morphosyntax in sequential bilingual children. And the majority of studies looking at bilingual uh, acquisition of bilingualism in children have looked at the majority language. And many of those studies have shown that sequential bilingual children, uh, when we compare them to monolingual children of the same age, they perform at a lower rate than monolingual children. In contrast, uh, there is a limited number of studies investigating the heritage language of those children. And so the majority of the studies have looked at the majority uh, language. And when we look at heritage languages, the majority of studies that have been published on, on heritage languages have been focusing on adults. Now, in recent years, there are also several studies on children, but still the majority of studies that we have on heritage language acquisition comes from adults. Now, importantly, when we're looking at heritage language acquisition, uh, we know that um, in the context of children who grow up in a country with the majority language in the, in the um, environment, and they go to a school where the majority language is the language of instruction, the heritage language gradually becomes weaker the more exposure the children have to the majority language. And this is one of the reasons that um, the incomplete language acquisition hypothesis has been formulated, uh, based on which 
insufficient input and use of the heritage language during childhood contributes to incomplete acquisition or better yet acquisition without mastery. So according to this hypothesis, heritage children do not master the heritage language. Now the prediction in that case is that heritage children should display similar performance to monolingual children at earlier stages of development, but they should show delays, problems and protraction in the heritage language development as they progress in schooling and as they get exposure to the majority language. So there may be an effect of um, language development of the children before they go into school and then when they go to school and later on with more schooling. According to this hypothesis, heritage children display some features akin to second language learners, since both groups show developmental and transfer errors and fossilization. And also the linguistic areas that develop late in L1 acquisition should show incomplete acquisition because they require more input and sustain exposure through reading and formal instruction at school. So if we look at phenomena that are early acquired, then we may find that heritage children have acquired them pretty well. But if we look at phenomena that are late acquired, then we may find more difficulties. So apart from the relatively limited research on heritage children in general, there is also very limited research on heritage children growing up in the UK. And there is limited research on how the heritage language develops alongside the majority language. And this is the context where this project was created. And this is also the context where the study, where we're going to present the study from. So we want to investigate how heritage and the majority language or bilingual children are developing at the same time in the same group of children. Now, um, what do we know about Turkish as, as a heritage language outside of that context? There have been studies on looking at Turkish as a heritage language, but again, the majority of those studies have been on adults. And there have been many studies uh, of Turkish in contact with German. Uh, there are a few studies on uh, Turkish in contact with Dutch. And as far as I know, there, there haven't been, at least in the UK context, studies on Turkish in contact with English. Now, what we know in, in terms of uh, Turkish in contact with German is, um, for adults, is that the um, heritage Turkish lacks complement clauses. And there is substitution of subordination with simpler sentences, uh, with coordinate sentences like conjoined clauses. And in, in uh, contact with Dutch, uh, studies have shown similar patterns. And for Dutch, uh, the patterns, that kind of patterns have been shown also not just for adults, but also for children. So, uh, well, in this study, we aim to test uh, in line with the incomplete acquisition hypothesis. We aim to test uh, whether Turkish speaking, uh, Turkish English bilingual children uh, living in the UK, in London in particular, uh, who acquire Turkish as their heritage language and who acquire English as their majority language, uh, show any signs of protracted acquisition in Turkish relative clauses. Uh, as Theo um, described, uh, relative clauses are already complex uh, for uh, children um, cross-linguistically. Uh, however, when we compare English and Turkish relative clauses, there are many differences. There are many cross-linguistic differences. Uh, so we were suspecting that this could be an area where we would observe um, signs of late development or incomplete acquisition in particular. So according to this hypothesis, uh, we would expect that late acquired structures would be missing in children's uh, language uh, and uh, they would fail in their comprehension of relative clauses, especially um, object relative clauses. And uh, we would not only expect delays, but also some uh, qualitative differences as well with respect to their comprehension patterns. And uh, we would similarly uh, um, uh, predict that they would perform 
worse in line with increasing age as they are exposed to the majority language more with schooling. Uh, and uh, as they age in, the, in that society, uh, we would expect their Turkish to uh, deteriorate. So uh, these, uh, this, was, this was the first aim we wanted to explore in this study. So in this, uh, um, our second aim was uh, to compare comprehension of Turkish relative clauses to that of uh, comprehension of English relative clauses. So uh, this was again related to the incomplete acquisition hypothesis because if uh, children, um, uh, if heritage language becomes weak uh, in line with increasing age, we would expect uh, children to perform worse as they become older, okay? So uh, that's why we tested two groups of children, preschooler and primary schoolers. So we would expect primary schoolers to show um, both uh, uh, worse performance and qualitative differences in their comprehension patterns. So uh, uh, another interesting feature that we wanted to explore in this study uh, was uh, related to the type of the metric structure that we embed the relative clause in. So uh, we, we wanted to manipulate the metric structure because uh, let me first talk, uh, talk about uh, 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 genitive case in object relative clause. Okay, so genitive case uh, as you see in the uh, in the sentence, hangisi gorilin itti aslan. So, which one is the lion that the gorilla pushes? Genitive case has two features. First, it is ambiguous. Um, when you hear a genitive case, it could be a subject of a complement clause, it could be a subject of a relative clause, or it could be a possessor in a possessive MP. So. We are not really sure at this point about the exact role of this noun phrase, gorilla. Okay. Uh, however, when you compare this to the subject relative clause, we have gorilla, uh, which is an accusative marked MP, uh, which has a clear, uh, more reliable accusative case that is a good sign, a reliable sign for uh, marking the object uh, in Turkish. Okay, so we were suspecting that the accusative case might be a better cue for children while they are assigning the theta roles compared to the genitive case. And uh, uh, in line with our previous study, we found that uh, both Turkish speaking children, monolingual children and adults uh, processed the sentence initial genitive case. Uh, I mean, it took longer for them to process sentence initial genitive case compared to the accusative case. Okay, so it was, they were fast to detect the accusative case and assign the uh, case, uh, assign the thematic role, whereas for the genitive case, it took them a little bit longer, significantly longer, actually. So first, ambiguity. Second, uh, as you see here, genitive case requires an upcoming expectation in the, up, uh, in the structure, in the rest of the structure. So when you hear a genitive case, Regardless of the interpretation of this case, be it a possessor or a subject of an embedded clause, you have to have this possessive agreement morpheme in the upcoming structure. So it poses an extra processing cost, uh, which is also again uh, documented in, in our previous study. Okay, so uh, therefore we were suspecting that object relative clauses in Turkish among other reasons, might be complex, more complex than subject relative clauses, especially because of the genitive case and this genitive possessive agreement. Okay. Uh, that's why we wanted to manipulate the metric structure in which we present the uh, relative clause. So in one of the uh, structure, we located the relative clause within a uh, question. So which one is the lion that pushes the gorilla? Hangisi gorilla iten aslan? So as you see, uh, this is our head noun. This is our gap co-index with this noun. And uh, this head noun is unmarked. There's no, uh, Mark, case marking on this now, okay? Uh, the same is true here. Hangisi gorilin itti asla. Again, the head noun is uh, close final, appears in the close final position and it is unmarked, okay? So let's have a look at another uh, metric structure. So, which is an imperative structure. 
point to the lion that pushes the gorilla. Uh, gorili iten aslanı göster. Or point to the lion that the gorilla pushes. Gorilin ittiği aslanı göster. So let's try to understand what kind of a structure we have here. Uh, again, uh, uh, in the subject relative clause, uh, the structure starts with uh, a sentence initial accusative marker. Uh, this is the embedded object, okay? Uh, but as you see, the uh, matrix subject, this is the matrix subject, is marked in the accusative case. Uh, there are two accusative markers in this uh, structure. Uh, whereas in the um, object relative clause, our subject, uh, embedded subject, is marked in the genitive case, and then our head noun, which is the uh, subject of the mat uh, sorry object of the matrix clause, uh, is marked in in the accusative case. So uh, luckily, this noun phrase uh, is at the same time uh, the embedded object. Uh, so we were thinking if children couldn't use the genitive case, maybe they would use this accusative case uh, that uh, marks. Uh, the uh, uh, noun that occupies two roles at the same time, object of the embedded clause and object of the uh, uh, matrix clause. Okay, so therefore our, excuse me, our uh, third aim was to test whether the accusative case in the imperative structure on, um, in relative clauses uh, would increase the performance. So we expect, let me show you once more, we expect uh, a better performance in object relative clauses when they were presented in uh, an imperative structure compared to a uh, question, okay? Uh, however, uh, when you look at the subject relative clause, uh, we may not really observe a similar pattern here. Uh, we might actually see a worse performance in uh, ob subject relative clauses when it is presented in imperative because there are two accusative marked MPs. So if the child is using the accusative case to uh, find the object, then this would complicate the matters. Okay, so uh, this is our prediction. Okay, so imperative, better performance in imperative in object relative clauses compared to questions. And uh, better performance in question compared to imperative in subject relative clauses. Do we have any questions at this point? I know it's very difficult to uh, you know, process a language that you don't know. So if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer. Uh, I think we will, we will do questions at the very end because we have yeah. a very large number of participants okay. in the room. All right, okay, okay, yeah. So uh, we tested uh, 27 Turkish English bilingual children. Uh, um, the uh, age of uh, mean age at the mean age of uh, five, th uh, three for the preschoolers and uh, seven for uh, primary schoolers. Uh, their onset, age of onset of acquisition uh, of uh, English, uh, age of um, onset uh, uh, for in exposure to English uh, began at the age of two for uh, both groups. And then uh, we tested uh, 38 monolingual age-matched uh, Turkish-speaking children uh, to compare how uh, uh, heritage children per perform in Turkish relative clauses uh, as compared to um, monolingual Turkish-speaking children. And then we also tested 50 age-matched uh, monolingual English-speaking children to compare how uh, heritage children perform, uh, bilingual children, I should say, perform in their English uh, compared to English-speaking monolingual children. Uh, these children were also matched with respect to uh, maternal education, uh, which ranged between 5 to 13 years. And uh, we didn't, uh, parents didn't report uh, any speech or cognitive uh, delays mm, in their development. Okay, so here you can see the uh, comprehension task that we used. We adapted it from uh, Flavia Adani. Uh, in this task, uh, we present the children with a picture where we have three animals uh, uh, of the same size, a camel kicking, for instance, a cow, and then this cow is kicking uh, the camel in the front. Okay, and we ask them point to the camel that is kicking the cow. 
So uh, for the subject relative clause, they should point to the camel on the left, uh, to my left. Uh, and for the object relative clause, point to the camel that the cow is kicking, they should point to the camel on the right, okay? Uh, and uh, the same, it is the same for the question structure. Which one is the camel that is kicking the cow or that the cow is kicking? So we used uh, 33 experimental items. All items were semantically reversible. Uh, and we had uh, 16 animals and we used all action verbs, as eight action verbs. Uh, and we controlled the lexical items we used with respect to their length, imageability, age of acquisition, and uh, the size of the animals. So small animals performed actions among themselves and larger animals were uh, grouped together. So, uh, and as I said, we manipulated two factors. Uh, the relative clause type between uh, subject relative clause and object relative clause, and we manipulated the matrix clause between imperative and uh, question. So let's have a look at the uh, uh, results now. Uh, in this graph, we see uh, the performance in Turkish relative clauses. Okay, so here you see the monolingual children, and here you see the uh, on the right you see the heritage children. By the way, can you see when I move the cursor? Okay, excellent. Mm -hmm. So let's begin with monolingual children uh, and how they perform in object relative clauses. So as they increase, as they grow older from uh, preschool to primary school, uh, we see a significant increase in their performance in object relative clauses, okay? But their performance in subject relative clause is already fine at those ages. Okay, and we see a very, very similar pattern uh, for uh, the heritage speaking children. So uh, they show a significantly better performance uh, in object relative clauses uh, when they are a primary school student compared to uh, uh, when they are a preschool, uh, at preschool age. Uh, so another uh, thing that this graph tells us is that uh, monolinguals performed better, significantly better than bilingual children in object relative clauses, not in subject relative clauses, uh, at both ages. So for this is true for both for preschoolers and uh, pre primary schoolers. Uh, those two uh, uh, age groups were significant. Okay, so we can say that uh, the development of subject relative clause is already in place, uh, but children still uh, show a development in their object, in their comprehension of object relative clauses. And uh, bilingual children uh, are significantly, uh, or significantly, uh, they perform significantly worse compared to monolingual children only in object relative cl clause. So in the structure that is still developing. Okay, they don't show any differences in uh, subject relative clause. So in this uh, graph, we see uh, the interaction between um, the RC type, relative clause type, and the uh, matrix structure. Uh, so let's see how we don't see any effect in the preschoolers, but uh, for the object relative clauses, we see a significant increase in their performance when the object relative clause was presented within an imperative structure compared to when it was presented in um, a question. And this same pattern is observed in uh, heritage speaking children as well. Okay. Uh, and there is just the opposite pattern for subject relative clauses. So the performance is better when the RC is presented within a question. And again, this is the same pattern we observe in the heritage group, okay? So uh, from this graph, uh, we can conclude that um, heritage speaking children do not actually show qualitatively different, different pattern uh, as both groups of children at the age of, um, uh, I mean, at uh, primary school ages, I, I, I think it was from age eight onwards, uh, they are able to use the case marking uh, uh, in order to find the object in the um, object relative clause. Uh, 
Okay. So this also shows that, uh, um, uh, or indicates or suggests that uh, genitive case might be one of the uh, problems uh, in um, uh, slow development, if uh, small, slow development of uh, object relative clauses in Turkish. Uh, finally, uh, here you see uh, compa the comparison of Turkish uh, and English relative clauses. So let's first have a look at uh, the uh, monolingual children. Okay. Uh, what we see in this part of the graph is that uh, both groups of children, both monolingual preschoolers and pri primary schoolers, they perform significantly better in subject relative clause uh, compared to object relative clauses. And this is true for both languages. So we can see that uh, despite the fact that these two languages have a lot of cross linguistic differences, uh, one of them marks the relative clause in uh, morph morphosyntax uh, and uh, has pre-nominal relative clauses, whereas English has post-nominal relative clauses. Despite all these differences, we see a, a similar pattern both in English and in Turkish, okay? Better development or better performance in subject relative clauses compared to object relative clauses. Let me have a look uh, the right, uh, right, right side of the graph, we see bilingual uh, children, uh, both in their Turkish and in their English. And what we see here is that both for Turkish uh, object relative clauses and English object relative clauses, we see a significant increase uh, in line with age. So we can say that uh, bilingual children uh, uh, continue their development of object relative clauses. Uh, so they don't really show um, burst performance in line with increasing age. So the exposure to majority language didn't render their Turkish um, uh, protracted uh, or their English uh, uh, is also similar in pattern when we, when we have a look at this graph. So just to summarize, we wanted to see whether late acquires, late acquired structures are missing uh, uh, in children uh, acquiring a heritage language. We didn't observe this. Uh, we didn't observe any uh, qualitative differences in the pattern uh, where they use the case marking for thematic role interpretation. Both groups of children uh, were able to use the case marking uh, if they had, uh, I mean, uh, at uh, primary school years. And uh, we see an increase, not a decrease, in their performance in line with uh, increasing age. Uh, and when we see, uh, when we uh, have a look at our second aim, we wanted to uh, compare Turkish and English. Again, uh, heritage language doesn't seem to be uh, weaker. Uh, we see that uh, they show uh, a significant increase uh, in their performance in object relative clauses. So we, we can say that they still show uh, an increase. Maybe la at later ages, we might observe some decrease, but uh, at this age, we didn't observe uh, such a decrease. And the last uh, aim, uh, again, uh, as we expected, uh, both primaries, uh, both monolingual and bilingual children were able to use the case marking for thematic role interpretation uh, at uh, older ages, okay, at, uh, when they were uh, at primary school years. So we can conclude that uh, uh, we can conclude that we, uh, we see uh, a very similar performance in monolingual and bilingual children uh, in their performance of uh, relative clauses. And we see a very similar performance in uh, relative clauses when we compare Turkish and English uh, language. Uh, and we can say that case marking cues do aid, uh, uh, do facilitate comprehension uh, for uh, relative clauses in Turkish. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much.